Hey everyone, yeah, I've been gone for a while. I apologize for my lackluster upload schedule. Alongside YouTube, I'm also doing a degree in computer science, so a lot of my time last semester was taken up by courseworks, exams, and other projects. But this semester, my workload isn't as heavy, so I'll be able to post more often. To be fair, my time management hasn't been great either, so I take accountability for that. But yeah, if you were wondering what's been happening these past few months, that was a quick little update just before we start this video. Anyway, now that's out of the way, let's get into it. It's February 11th, 2020. It was a cold, crisp afternoon in the city of Reggio Emilia where the world of Formula 1 came together for the first car launch of the season. Under the spectacular lights featuring an orchestra, choir and ballet dancers, Ferrari's 2020 challenger made quite the entrance. Team principal Mattia Bonotto was optimistic about their title hopes for the year as he said the prancing horse had pushed the boundaries and been extreme on the car concept. He said the car was completely different to the one of 2019 as they tried to maximize downforce and aero performance as well as increased reliability. The stage was set for an epic title battle between the two titans of Formula 1. In a year that would feature their 1000th Grand Prix on home soil in Mugello, it would have been an incredible story if they had put an end to the run of Mercedes dominance. With hindsight however, this story will forever remain a what could have been. In 2020, Ferrari had their worst season in the sports for 40 years. Their sixth place in the championship saw them record their lowest finish since 1980, the only time they finished outside the top six in the Constructors' Championship since its inauguration back in 1958. For a team that has won the award a total of 15 times, more than any other team in the history of the sport, 2020 was bad. Historically bad. They didn't lead a single lap throughout the entire season and only twice did both cars manage to make it into Q3. Considering how quick they were in the second half of 2019, questions began to emerge about their sudden downturn in performance, especially in the engine department. The situation wasn't helped by the fact that the FIA launched an investigation into this power unit and came to an undisclosed agreement with the Prancing Horse over their engine's legality. Prior to the delayed season opener in Austria, Ferrari decided to completely change their approach to the SF1000. They worked hard on addressing the lack of downforce they experienced in 2019 by improving their aero efficiency. However, changes to the technical regulations regarding the power units hit the Scuderia hard. The lack of engine power was clear for everyone to see, and particularly evident at Spa, where Leclerc was 10 km an hour slower in the speed trap compared to the previous year. What's more is that Ferrari were the only team on the grid not to improve their 2019 lap time around that circuit. But they weren't just slow in a straight line, their car was also suffering through the corners as well. This was down to the fact that they had developed their car around a completely different and much faster engine before the FIA implemented rule changes to them. Despite this, they still achieved three podiums during the season, with Leclerc scoring a P2 and P3 in Austria and Silverstone respectively, and Vettel scoring a P3 in Istanbul. And while we're on the topic of Leclerc and Vettel, we might as well talk about the ridiculously large performance gap there was between them. Sebastian Vettel's struggles in 2020 were hard to watch for some and meme-worthy for meme others. Like but at the end of the day, for whatever reason, he couldn't get to grips with his Ferrari. The mystery behind the German's poor form can't be pinned under just one factor, rather a combination of different factors. For example, the car had a rather skittish rear end that he found difficult to control more often than not. We also have to consider what was going on behind closed doors, considering he didn't even know Ferrari had signed Sainz during the winter break of 2019, so the team had essentially given up on him. Another factor I believe played a part is that after losing 2018, partly of course through his own mistakes, he lost that psychological edge we saw him possess over his rivals during the 2009-13 era. To add more insult to injury, Charles then came in the very next season and straight up just beat him. Yeah, you could make an argument for it being close, but when you look at the season as a whole, Leclerc was the faster driver on a Saturday, scored more points and more race wins, including one of Ferrari's home race in Monza. He earned his number one status within the team and started receiving most, if not all the attention. Just to clarify, I'm not blaming or accusing Seb for the way his breakup with Ferrari played out. It was a two-way thing but it undoubtedly had a major impact on their poor performance in 2020. The regulation changes for 2021 were very limited, but enough for Ferrari to make a solid step forward. Looking at the first seven races, they were consistently the third fastest team behind Mercedes and Red Bull over one lap, including back-to-back -back pole positions for Charles Leclerc in Monaco and Azerbaijan. This was already a huge step up from their qualifying form in 2020, where making Q3 was often a struggle. 
To prove this, I calculated the average gap between themselves and Mercedes in quali sessions that weren't affected by wet weather, and it came to around 1.2 seconds. For comparison, I did the same for 2021, and after the first seven races, their average deficit to the Mercs was just three tenths, and over the course of the season, the average came to just over half a second. And yeah, we do need to consider the impact the new regulations had on Mercedes drop in performance relative to their dominant 2020 season. But nevertheless, Ferrari still made some great progress given the circumstances. The upturn in quality pace enabled the drivers to fight for more competitive point scoring positions. Through the car's improved race pace, they were able to capitalize on these opportunities more often, ending the season with five podiums overall. And had it not been for Leclerc not starting in Monaco and Hamilton's comeback drive in Silverstone, an argument can be made for them scoring two race wins. Their average points per race increased from 7.7 .7 to 14.7, helping them to secure third in the Constructors' Championship over their main rivals McLaren. 2021 was a season of growth for the Scuderia, both technically and operationally. Their power unit developments over the winter break included a revised turbo as well as increased thermal efficiency to the internal combustion engine MGUH and other energy recovery components. They also decided to spend their allocated two development tokens on a new gearbox and rear suspension to give the SF21 a thinner rear end compared to the SF1000. In addition to this, they brought an upgraded power unit to the Russian Grand Prix and it proved pivotal in their fight for third with McLaren. It was also described by Benotto as a significant step in gaining experience for 2022. Ferrari shifted their main development focus to the SF75 back in May last year, earlier than both Mercedes and Red Bull. Given they also had more time in the wind tunnel than the top two due to the sliding scale introduced last season, they could very well return to fighting for wins and championships again. At the end of 2021, Bonotto was quoted in an interview saying that the new Ferrari had a lot of innovation. And now that it's been released, I can honestly get behind this claim. By simply looking at the car, you can tell they've really thought outside the box with the aero concepts. All the teams have gone with their own unique car designs. But in my opinion, the Ferrari looks to have taken the most radical approach. Now I want to take a moment to appreciate this man, for how he completely aced his debut season in arguably the highest pressure environment in Formula 1. Yes, as with any driver, there were areas he could have improved, but all in all, Carlos Sainz was mega from the very onset. Many, including myself, expected him to be somewhat of a wingman to Leclerc, given the Monegasque's established position within the team. Carlos is an incredibly hard worker and made it his number one priority to quickly build a strong relationship with his engineers. And this might not have been the most obvious difference maker, nor can it be measured numerically, but it was definitely significant in helping him settle so fast. In any team sports, communication is extremely important. The better the chemistry between teammates, coaches, engineers and so on, the easier it is to create a successful dynamic. Sainz was often referred to as engineer-like in his ability to provide feedback on the car's behaviour, be it the McLaren or the Ferrari. We saw McLaren grow because of his presence. Not only did he bring high quality performances on a consistent basis, but he also brought the mentality of a team player, enabling them to extract the most from race weekends. The science effect is clearly noticeable within Maranello too, and going into the new season, I expect him to have leveled up even more. As for his teammates, I rate Charles Leclerc to be among the top 5 drivers right now, with the potential to be the best driver in the world at some point. I think a lot of people have forgotten just how good he is, given the Ferrari hasn't been that competitive recently. He ended 2019 with the most pole positions and claimed 2 out of the team's 3 victories overall, both of which came under extremely high pressure situations. Yeah, you could say illegal engine or whatever. The point is that he knows how to deliver when it matters. Even through the last two seasons, when the car wasn't a race winning one, he still pulled out some tremendous performances. If the SF75 is capable of winning the championship, both he and Sainz have the ability to bring home the driver's crown. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll have to wait and see exactly where the Ferrari stands in the pecking order compared to the rest. But until then, I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more F1 related content in the future. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.